Mel, you will enjoy his uh, leading us in worship here. But first of all, we're going to hear from Kent Redford. Now, I hear that some of the people on the on the green bus were saying there's too much devotion, so uh, where he's going to give an altar call at the end of his message there and get him saved. I got to tell you the funniest thing that's happened so far on the trip for me. Eleanor, where's Eleanor? Right up there, Eleanor. She was awesome. Uh, uh, she wanted to help everybody wash their hands with these hand sanitizer cloth things. So she gave one to Dave and one to Debbie and one to Paula, and uh, they gave one to me. But I thought I'd read the I thought I'd read the case. It said medicated for hemorrhoids. <laughs> And so Dave's over there washing his face and stuff. I was thinking, that's a funny hemorrhoid. That's what I was thinking. And, uh, yeah. And so, uh, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I know archaeologically 100% what happened here. And, uh, that's about 99% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I couldn't figure out which one story to tell or talk about. So, uh, the other day, kind of jokingly, but, uh, you know, the Corinthian passage is really about the Old Covenant had this glory, but the New Covenant has a greater glory. If the Old Covenant was written in stone with a glory, the New Covenant is written on our heart with a greater glory. And uh, I talk about being called to be an apostle, called to be holy, called to be in fellowship with Christ, and I think maybe almost all of us have that figured out. We know that we're called. We know that we're to be holy. And uh, and so my heart, I'm 54, uh, my heart began to say there's got to be more than this, than just knowing that I'm called uh, to be holy, called to be in fellowship with Christ. And uh, how about everybody say there's more? Yeah, I, I knew there had to be more. And... Uh, and reading 2 Corinthians 3, I found, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. And I realized that in my calling to be who I am, my calling to be holy, my calling to be in fellowship with Christ, God had a greater glory for my life. And uh, I decided I'm not an evangelical. I'm a Pentecostal. And uh, evangelicals view Acts and Luke as something that happened in the past. Whereas Pentecostals view Luke and Acts as something that is supposed to happen today. And so while we're here on this boat, the same God that uh, let Peter walk on water right here, the same God that did the miraculous catch of fish right here, the same God that walked up and down that shore over there, and it was said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and it said, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That same God is supposed to do something on this boat today. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're not like cruising through history, we're cruising through our future, right? We are viewing what God wants us to be. When I was there with, uh, with uh, Jay talking at, uh, at Lydia's place where she was baptized, I'm thinking, Lord, what country are you calling me into to be the first guy in and say, you know what, here's somebody, they were the first person baptized in their language group. It's not just for Bible days, it's for me. And it says in this text that I'm reading, with ever-increasing glory. And so what I'm going to have us do in just a minute, I'm going to have you pray for people that there would be an increasing glory on their life today. Right here on this boat, right here in this beautiful weather, right here with this great band, greater glory. But you see, what happens is the cry for greater glory brings us into a direct meeting with transition. For me to have greater glory, something has to change in my life. It calls me into this meeting place with, with uh, stepping out of my comfort zone or, or getting kicked out of the nest, as it were. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, But we have this treasure, what treasure? The treasure of the glory of God in jars of clay. Hey, how about you turn to somebody and say, nice jar there. <laughs> you know what? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah nice, nice clay pot there, Joe. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And when I begin to say there's got to be more, I realize something has to happen in this broken down clay vessel. That when I long for greater glory, Paul says, this treasure is in a jar of clay. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Here's a great line. One of my heroes preached at our church about 10 years ago. Her name's Elizabeth Elliot. And she stood up at our pulpit and she said this, When the claims of Christ intersect the human will, something has to die. And so today I stand here saying, The claim of Christ on my life is greater glory. That means the clay pot has to die. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear much fruit. The transition from living to dying is amazingly difficult. My daughter is, uh, our daughter is eight, was 18. She went to India. Manali is a region in North India. When she got there to work with the missionary, some local pastor or some local people met with her. She, they said to our 18-year-old daughter, please don't go where you're going. They kill Christians there. It's the region of the world where the most Christians were killed this year, they said to our 18-year-old daughter. Please don't go. You're single. You're a single girl. I said, Keila, what did you say? She said, Daddy, I'm already crucified with Christ. What can they do to me? Here I am, a 50-something-year-old dad, saying, you know what? I wish I had that ability to die in my clay body. I wish I had that ability to say what Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. The transition from living to dying is amazingly difficult. I could stand here and be truthful and say, God wants you all to prosper. Amen? He does. But he also called you come and die. And when we stand here and think about these transitions in our life, you know, when you take a step, as it were, this foot dies to that, and then it steps down and comes to life. And that movement is that whole, that whole process of living and dying. You see, the challenge is that on the other side of the transition is greater glory. On the other side of your situation is greater glory. If you read the 23rd Psalm, you can break it up like this. For the valley, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want to make me lie down in green pastures. In the valley, I shall not fear, for thou art with me. But after the valley, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On the other side of the transition is this greater glory that God has for our lives. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so when we have an unveiled face about the jar of clay, we're then candidates for greater glory. I grew up in the Assemblies of God. My dad was everything you could be at a local level. He, was, uh, he, he pastored Alaska's smallest church because he started it with just my mom and uh, three of us. He pastored our largest church. He, uh, he, he did the uh, secretary treasurer. He did all that. But I learned in our, my first movement, keep a veil over your face. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you? Blessed. How are you? God is good. I never really learned that part of the greater glory is lifting the veil off of your face so that it could be the truthful you could reflect the Lord's glory. We have this treasure of his glory in jars of clay. And Paul says, with an unveiled face, we with an unveiled face reflect the Lord's glory. I did not want to have an unveiled face. I wanted to look like it was good all the time. I wanted to look safe, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost 24-7. 
I didn't want any obstacle to look bigger than I could ex uh, handle, but I came to the place of realizing that there's no greater glory until I unveil my broken down clay pot before the Lord. David said, search me, O God, and know me. On the other side of unveiling your face is a greater glory from the Lord. And so as we're out here on this beautiful lake and thinking about the glory of the Lord, I want to challenge you, even in this last week that we have together, in the timing of the Lord, don't do it by man-made skill, unveil your face before somebody and reflect the Lord's glory. Well, I was kind of forced into it. I stepped up to preach on a Sunday, and all of a sudden I started gagging, and I couldn't talk anymore. And our church is looking at me, and I'm gagging, and I'm embarrassed. What in the world is wrong with me? I gotta get out of here. Uh, I got, and so I said, I can't finish this sermon. I gotta go. And I just walked right off the platform. Well, you see, about 25 years before that, a man walked into the back of our church. He was in a brown suit, an uh, Italian fine woolen suit. And he walked down the side aisle, my left aisle, and he found his ex girlfriend who had broken up with him the night before. He pulled out a 357 and he shot her in the head, and then he shot himself right during our prayer time. And uh, what happened on that Sunday when I was standing there in the bag is a man came in in a brown Italian suit and stood in the exact same place the other guy did when I thought he was reaching in for his, his pistol. In fact, he was reaching in for his tithe and offering. I couldn't function, really. And so I, I went to a counselor and I found out that since I was three years, I'm 54, for 51 years I've had post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD. It started when I was three years old and my kidneys failed and I was the only boy, only child in my unit that lived. Every night a boy in the bed next to me died and they took him off. And so here I am gagging in front of an entire church, feeling the light in the school. I went to my office and I began to cry. I said, nobody will ever want to listen to a preacher who gagged. Nobody will ever want to listen to a guy like he has a mighty God and he can't even do a sermon. But brothers and sisters, when I unveiled my faith, let me say this too, PTSD is officially a mental illness. Right? So the other day a man came up to me and said, Kid, how are you doing with your mental illness? That didn't bless me a bit. Right? It's like, no, thank you. I don't want to be known. But you know what, brothers and sisters? I decided, all the, before I got here, of course, with other people, to unveil my face and say, God, I want to unveil my broken down clay vessel. I want to unveil my broken down clay pot that you might increase your glory and flow through me at a higher level than you've ever flowed through my life ever before. And it's happening. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and say, because you tell your story, I have something I have never told anybody ever before. The goal isn't for me to have respect, and the goal isn't for me to have you like me and think that my life is all together. The goal is that my broken down clay pot will show the ever increasing glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so out here in the middle of this ocean, I want you to be able to just say, you know what, God? i got to unveil my face just a little bit because I long for greater glory. I long for the touch of the Master's hand on my life. There is no reason why right now arthritis can't be healed. There's no reason why right now depression can't be healed. There's no reason that right now divine guidance cannot be given. Why? Because God says when we unveil the face... He brings us a brand new level of His glory. So my goal is that this is the glory boat. Not the green or the yellow. <laughs> the glory boat. And we experience the presence of God with unveiled faces. So I'm going to see if they'll pray, I mean play and worship. And I want everybody to pray for at least two people, all right? And I don't mean like getting a group of three. I mean pray for somebody and then move to somebody else. And just here's the prayer I want you to pray. Greater glory as they unveil their face, Lord. Greater glory as they unveil their face. Amen? Let's do it. Sing and let's pray. <laughs> 